The scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew's gospel, Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus the Messiah, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Here ends this reading, inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. You might be thinking it's a little early to be telling the birth story of Jesus. After all, next Sunday is Christmas, but the lectionary doesn't care. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way, ready or not, church, Jesus is coming. This is not my favorite account of the birth of Jesus, although there really aren't many options. There are only two versions to choose from, Matthew and Luke. The Gospels, according to Mark and John, include nothing on the matter of Jesus' birth. They have their reasons. Matthew and Luke, though, Both give us an account, and like the two stories of creation in Genesis, there are some similarities, but many differences. I prefer Luke's account primarily because of the myriad of voices in it. In the Gospel of Matthew, hardly any real people speak. Angels speak, but people do not. Mary does not speak, not one word, Joseph either. There is no story about Zechariah and Elizabeth, and later when Jesus is taken to be dedicated in the temple, the prophets Anna and Simeon are absent. There is no description of the journey to Bethlehem, no looking for room at the inn, no manger or barn animals, no choirs of angels or shepherds to worry with. But Matthew has other qualities. Matthew does not give us as many distractions. We get from a pregnant Mary to divorce plans to a divine dream that leads to a shotgun wedding and the birth of a baby in just eight verses. That's quite a bit of ground to cover. Matthew is direct about the whole point. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Oh dear, the S word, sin. He will save his people from their sins. For those who were raised in more con- with more conservative theology, sin and Jesus as Savior were central to our church experience. Jesus as Savior sent by God to redeem the sinful world because our relationship with God was, quite sadly, a transaction, one we did not even know we had entered into just by being born. Perhaps When you hear that word sin, it triggers your BTSD, bad theology stress disorder. For a long time, the church taught, and in many instances still teaches, that sin sends people to hell, that place of eternal damnation and what Jesus was sent to save us from. But please, church, read your Bible. It does not say that Jesus was sent to save his people from hell, but from sin. Jesus himself said very little about our post-mortem residency, and hardly any of what he did say referenced hell as one of the afterlife options. 
The very few times Jesus spoke about hell, the word he used was the proper name for the town dump where trash was burned, not the fiery residence of the devil. The unfortunate consequence of that bad theology is that when we hear he will save his people from their sins, we don't actually hear it. We hear he will save his people from hell. We listen with post-Nicene Creed ears. That is, we hear this statement and assume that Matthew is speaking of Jesus' essence. The only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, and further on, for our sake, he was crucified. Translation, Jesus, perfect and sinless, was born to die because humans are so bad. Our very nature makes us complicit in cosmic child sacrifice. This is why the church can't have nice things. Really, this is why people leave church and never come back. The Nicene Creed is what happens when you lock a bunch of bishops in a room and threaten to kill them if they can't come up with something agreeable to the emperor. It is a test of faith, not a testimony of faith. Many, many people have found this theology unconscionable. And this is probably why you showed up in this, particularly, this particular sanctuary. You might be thinking that we won't talk about sin around here. There's too much baggage that comes with that word, that progressive Christian theology doesn't need sin, just the comforting phrase, God is love. So we really don't need Jesus to save us from our sins. Surely there won't be any talk of sin from this pulpit. <laughs> but around here, we believe deeply that God means to save the world through us. And we are deeply convinced that Jesus, the itinerant peasant preacher, was the living, breathing, fully human example of how we're supposed to do just that. Many of us understand sin as anything that keeps us out of full and right relationship with God and our neighbors. So we take the claim, he shall save his people from their sins, very seriously. So seriously that we name sin out loud and often, although not always as early as we should, to get better at recognizing those things that keep us from full and right relationship within the luminous web. Every Sunday we say together a prayer of confession, which can be confusing to people who believe that we are heathens or heretics. We sometimes distinguish between individual and corporate sins, but while we might not think we are guilty of certain corporate sins, our individual choices, like where we spend our money and when we choose to stay, stay silent, these choices support public policies, social norms, and laws that are sinful. The usual complaint about talking of sin, of naming sin, and prayers of confession is, it's just about making people feel guilty, feel badly about ourselves, our circumstances. This is not the case. This naming of sins is not about making us feel guilty. As a, as a pastor, I can tell you that people are already very good at feeling guilty. We do not need any help feeling badly about things. I do not know any church person who does not feel guilty about something. We are sorry about things all the time. But feeling guilty does not mean we do anything differently. As Barbara Brown Taylor wrote, our chronic guilt is the price we are willing to pay in order to avoid change. We believe that if we feel badly enough about what we are doing, then we may continue doing it. It is painful to admit, but it is true. We believe that we should invest in public schools because all children deserve a free and quality education, but instead of providing our own presence in our underfunded neighborhood elementary school, 
It's easier to just feel guilty as we write the check to the private preschool. We know that the earth is running a fever, that climate change is already displacing millions of the most vulnerable, and that we are responsible for caring for God's creation. That's what we teach the kids in Sunday school. But instead of making difficult changes to our lifestyle, we just feel badly about not recycling consistently. We know that most of our technology, our gadgets, and the good deals fought over on Black Friday are made by children and adults in conditions we cannot imagine, and that it is our demand that keeps them working in factories for wages that won't cover groceries for the week. Yet instead of reprioritizing, instead of making do, or instead of saying no, we feel guilty enough to make a donation to an organization that works to end modern day slavery and then get right back to browsing on Amazon. So no, feeling guilty is not the point. God is not interested in making us feel guilty. We are already good at that. God is interested in making us aware of the very real possibility of new life right here on earth. Only when we recognize that things are broken can we begin to the, do the work of making things right. This is why we must talk about sin, that we might not just feel bad, but actually change. We have to talk about what will happen if we continue down the road we're on. To help, we have the stories of Jesus, the circumstances of his birth, his ministry to the poor and the outcast, his political activism, his critique of rigid religion, and how and why he was killed. The claim he will save his people from their sins is the legend to our reading the New Testament map. Look here at this injustice. Make note of the consequences of religious legalese. Here, here is an example of what happens when we break bread together. Go and do likewise. In the second chapter of Matthew, just after the story of the birth of Jesus, we are asked to consider the sin of refusing to welcome the stranger. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus flee a mad dictator who is murdering children we know that story. Christians should be hypersensitive to the plight of Middle Eastern refugees because that's exactly the status of the Holy Family. Given that we are told again and again that this is a Christian nation and our state is the most Christian of them all, you would think we would have an open border policy. But Oklahoma has taken in only a handful of Syrian refugees, despite more than 22,000 of them resettling in the United States. As we move through the life of Jesus and what he taught, we are reminded of the sin of pretending to be powerless as if we are too small and the machine is too big for us to stop it. But Jesus was a Jew living under Roman occupation. The Gospels are one story after another story after another story of turning the empire upside down and shaking out all the corruption and oppression from its pockets. Turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give your coat and your cloak. These are not stories about being nice, but about how to engage in nonviolent resistance. And don't forget the sin of greed manifested in our state with tax cuts for the wealthiest while one out of six Oklahomans live below poverty level. Or how when the rest of us grouse about paying taxes, it's like we resent this piece of how we make sure everyone has enough. Keep in mind that Jesus said of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and caring for the sick, just as you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. There's also the sin of capital punishment, which should be particularly offensive to those who claim to follow someone who was murdered by the government. Yeah, 
Those are definitely not stories about keeping us out of an imaginary lake of fire or making us feel guilty or teaching us how to be nice. They are about doing better, making hard choices of calling out injustice and making a regular practice of examining our hearts and our lives. Matthew tells us that eventually, after a life of welcoming the stranger, praying for his enemies and pushing back against the powers that be, they called Jesus Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. That's what they thought of how he lived. Wouldn't it be something to earn a nickname like that.